William Peter Powell is one of the most forgotten abolitionists, yet in his day he was so well connected, he was at the centre of all transatlantic activity and he really is someone who deserves to be better remembered. Part of William's invisibility is that we have no photographs of him. There are no images of William, so we don't know what he looked like. There is probably just one image of his son who became the army surgeon. And why no photographs? Because when we think of Frederick Douglass, we visualize him because he was the most photographed man probably in America. So very stark contrast to William. And again, was it modesty? Was it the cost? Uh, we don't really know but we will never know what William looks like. So William Powell was born in New York in 1807. His father had been a slave, but as was custom, when New York freed slave, he became a free black man. His mother was a free black woman. He's interesting because he actually attended a school for black children of slaves or of former slaves, the African Free School which had been formed in the 1780s, we're not sure of the exact date. One of the founders was Alexander Hamilton, who most people know because of the music, and it gave a very good education. Initially, just white teachers were hired, but then that practice was stopped. At one point, it's thought that it actually had as many as 1,000 pupils. Unfortunately, despite its success and its unique role in New York educational life, it closed in the 1830s, and it closed because it was part of a wider debate about colonization. There were some people within the abolition movement who felt that black people in America should return to Africa, whereas other people argued, no, they're American. They were born in America, so they have a right to stay here. And that became a major source of contention, both both within the abolition movement and within the school. So in the mid 1830s, the school closed its doors. Little is known about his parents, but it's thought that his mother had some Native American connections and his father as a young man had been enslaved. William Powell is interesting because he received education. He was obviously highly educated, but he chose to be a seaman and for some years he worked at sea. We don't know too much about that, but then when he retired from sea, he devoted himself to opening boarding houses for seamen who were in various ports. And that's really what he did for most of his life. He ran seamen's homes and only for colored seamen. And he had a very strong ethic that the home should be clean, they should be affordable, they should be places where People had a chance to self-educate, to read the Bible, to better themselves. And that was his whole philosophy, self-improvement, and for black people to actually change their own lives, not for other people to do it for them. So after he retired from sea, he didn't go back to New York, but he went to New Bedford. And New Bedford is interesting for many reasons. Its association with whaling, obviously it was a port, and it had another famous resident, Frederick Douglass. And the two men became very good friends. Unfortunately, later on, they did fall out. Um, but they both settled in New Bedford, which was a safe haven because there was a Fugitive Slave Act. Frederick Douglass was in danger of being captured at any time. But New Bedford was both a centre of abolitionist activity and it was home to many, many Quakers. And Quakers were at the forefront of abolition in America. We don't know exactly when William joined the abolitionist movement, but we do know he was very involved in the formation of the American Anti-Slavery Society. That would have brought him in contact with the most famous white abolitionist of the day, William Lloyd Garrison. And William was one of the signatories to the Philadelphia Declaration of Sentiments, which really led the way for the American abolition movement. William Lloyd Garrison was not only a founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society, he also founded the newspaper, The Liberator. And he, very early on, understood um, the importance of what we would now call social media, of connecting with people, keeping them informed. And The Liberator had a global reach as well. 
So there had been various divisions within the anti-slavery movement. Um, in America, some people felt that Garrison was too radical. So there was a breakaway group that became known as the Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. And they had a sister organization known as the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. What's interesting is that within Ireland, most abolitionists tended to be at the radical end of abolition. They believed that emancipation should be immediate, that black people were the equal of white people, and that slave owners should not be compensated. When Frederick Douglass arrived in Ireland, he was a supporter of Garrison. But we know that when he returned to America in 1847, in some ways he had outgrown Garrison. His two years away had given him agency, a voice. So we see a distance that's both intellectual and physical, because when Frederick returned, he moved up to Rochester, away from Garrison. But he increasingly split from Garrison's ideas. And the split really came to a head in 1851. And at that point, William Powell decided he would stay with Garrison. And the split was over a number of issues. One was the Constitution. Garrison and his followers believed that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Uh, Frederick came to reject that idea and believed that the Constitution could be modified. Another difference was the whole concept of political involvement and political engagement. Garrison believed that you could never achieve anything by working through a political party. Um, Frederick Douglass and other anti-Garrisonians came to believe that political action, political involvement was necessary to end enslavement. The split became very personal, unfortunately, because Frederick Douglass and William Powell had been great friends. When Douglass returned from Ireland and he founded his own newspaper, The North Star, William Powell had raised money on his behalf. But after 1851, the two men really um, criticised each other very, very publicly, and at times it could be quite nasty. So it was just unfortunate that men who'd been friends sort of became enemies. In New Bedford, William met the woman who was to become his wife, Mercy, and together they went on to have seven children. And it was really because of his children that he felt increasingly frustrated living in America, and he felt that his children would never get a fair chance to be the equal of white people. And this really especially revolved around his eldest son who wanted to be a doctor. And again, just he didn't have the opportunity to train in America. And so in 1850, he pretty well went on what was a fact-finding mission. And that took him to the United Kingdom. And as part of that fact-finding mission, he went to Ireland. And at the beginning of 1851, he lectured in the beautiful rotunda rooms in the centre of Dublin. He lectured alongside someone who's much more famous as an abolitionist, Reverend Henry Garnett. Interestingly, those two men had been at school together in the African Free School, so again, another long friendship. Um, interestingly also, Garnett was not a Garrisonian. He didn't support William Lloyd Garrison, but 
they overcame their differences, they lectured together a few times in Dublin. Um, both were very accomplished lecturers. And one other thing they did, which is very touching, is while they were in Dublin, they visited the grave of the great Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator, and in my mind, one of the greatest transatlantic abolitionists, white abolitionists that ever was. And he had died in 1847. He had met Frederick Douglass just once during Frederick Douglass's time in Ireland. And Daniel O'Connell was actually buried in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Again, Again, very historic because O'Connell had founded that cemetery because up to that point Catholics couldn't be buried alongside Protestants so it was to be an ecumenical graveyard. So in 1851 Garnet and William Powell visited the grave of Daniel O'Connell. The Rotunda is a particularly interesting location. It was opened in the 18th century and it was opened to provide finance for the adjoining Rotunda Hospital, which is thought to be the first maternity hospital in the world. And the Rotunda had many rooms, some very, very grand, and it had beautiful gardens. Unfortunately, it's derelict now. It's at what is now referred to as Parnell Square. So you can still see the building, you can imagine its beauty. But one of the things it did was it was a host to a number of visiting abolitionists, and that included the great um, black opera singer, Elizabeth Greenfield, and then when she visited in 1858, 1859, the amazing Sarah Parker Remond, whose brother also visited Ireland in 1841, Charles Lennox Remond. One of the reasons William came to Dublin was that Dublin was again at the centre of transatlantic abolition. And apart from Daniel O'Connell, who died 1847, one of the main activists was a Quaker called Richard Davis Webb. And he met William Powell and they became friends. Richard Davis Webb is somebody who really deserves to be better known. He was not only a leading Irish abolitionist, he was at the centre of everything that happened regarding transatlantic abolition. He was a printer by trade, he was a Quaker, he was a pacifist, he believed in animal rights, human rights, so a pretty incredible person. But more importantly, whenever an abolitionist came to town, he opened up his house to them. And Frederick Douglass, when he first came to Ireland, stayed at his home for over a month. And when Frederick Douglass is an elderly man revisited Ireland. He stayed at the Webb House. Unfortunately, Richard was dead at that stage, but he stayed with his son, Alfred. So Richard Webb and his extended family, including his amazing wife, Hannah, welcomed many abolitionists, including William, to Dublin. The 1850s really witnessed a number of setbacks for the abolitionist movement, starting with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Now there was already one in place from 1794, but this new legislation was much more draconian. And anybody who harboured, somebody who had escaped from enslavement, could be very severely punished and thrown into jail. And then a few years later, the Supreme Court passed the Dred Scott decision which said that black people were not citizens and the implication of that was they could not have passports. And we know um, a few years later, Sarah Parker Remond actually called the American government out on that when she was traveling in the United Kingdom. And William Powell really objected to this new legislation. Some of his friends had been enslaved, when we think of Frederick Douglass, for example. Um, and so he, at this point, decided he needed to leave America. He felt there was no future there for former slaves, no future there for his own children. And so, in 1850, William undertook his fact-finding mission and as we know, he visited Ireland during that time. He went back to America where he stayed for a few months. Um, he was very involved in New York with a group called The Thirteen who opposed the Fugitive Slave Act.
But at that point, he'd made up his mind. He had to leave America. And so at the end of 1851, with his seven children, his wife, Mercy, they sailed to England and then settled in Liverpool. When William and his family chose to relocate to England, they chose to settle in the great port of Liverpool. And again, for a man who was interested in sailings, who had operated boarding houses, this was a really good choice. And it was also important because when visiting abolitionists came from America, they sailed into Liverpool. And he would often open up his home to these people and they would stay with him. So famously, the crafts, who had to leave Boston because the Fugitive Slave Act, William and Ellen, they stayed at his home, as did Sarah Parker Remond when she visited, as did a fugitive called Josephine, that's all we know about her, who stayed at his home in 1856. So it must have been a welcoming sight to see their friend in Liverpool with his family. What's interesting about William is that while some of the black abolitionists who visited were actually fated by people in power or by people leading members of the abolitionist society, William Powell was actually very low-key and he worked for a living. He worked both running a boarding house for sailors and in insurance companies. Um, that dealt with seagoing issues. But we know from the places he lived, he actually lived a pretty humble existence and never really seemed to have any money. Sometimes women are overlooked in the story of abolition, but women were really the backbone of the abolitionist movement on both sides of the Atlantic. And one of the things that women in America did in order to raise funds for the American Anti-Slavery Society was they held what was called annual bazaars, which were great marketplaces. Abolitionist women would make goods, uh, people would submit autographs, paintings, knitted goods, things that could be sold, and then that money would go back to the anti-slavery society. And in Ireland, women were particularly active in sending over goods to be sold at the bazaars. And one of the functions that William did, because he knew both sides of the Atlantic so well, was he offered to be the conduit for goods that came from Ireland to Liverpool to then ultimately go to Boston. So again, he played a very important role in transatlantic slavery and in supporting American anti-slavery, even from his home in Liverpool. It was because he knew the docks, he knew that world. One of the motivations for William leaving America was for his children to get a good education. And he always used the example of his son William wanting to be a doctor, but not being allowed any training in America. And what is really lovely is that William Jr. got training in Dublin. So he qualified in Dublin. He, like his father, returned to America at the outbreak of the Civil War. But again, they both played very interesting roles. William Jr. became a surgeon in the army, uh, very effective. I think there were only 13 black surgeons in the Union Army. Um, disappointingly, he was denied a pension, seemingly because of his color. So that um, very uh, disappointing treatment. And after the war was over, William Jr. continued his service and he worked in what were called contraband hospitals, which were hospitals for black people who had been wounded or displaced during the war. What's interesting about William the father is he recruited after 1863 for black people to enlist, but not enlist for the army, but to enlist for the Navy. To some extent, William Powell's later years are a mystery. We know he returned to the States with his family in 1861. He really believed that the war would lead to the end of enslavement and hopefully to equality for black people.
At a certain point, William decided to move back to New York, and there he opened again coloured seamen's boarding houses. And he had them at the waterfront, one was on Cherry Street, one was on Pearl Street, and they were extremely successful. And again, part of his generosity was that when there was an unemployed sailor around, he wouldn't charge them. But also his boarding houses became centres of abolitionist activity. And when Frederick Douglass was visiting New York, he would either stay with William or recommend that other people would stay with William. So again, William is playing a very pivotal role within the abolitionist movement in New York. And the other thing he did was obviously sailors go all over the world and they became surreptitiously messengers, global messengers for the abolition movement and they would carry messengers, abolitionist tracts from port to port. So again, William is at the heart of what becomes a global movement. One of the other things, and again, it was a lifelong activity for William, is he believed in organised labour. And he believed that seamen needed to self-organise in order to improve their loss. Black sailors were particularly poorly treated. They received low pay. And if they went into port in the south, they were actually in danger of being captured and enslaved. So he very much encouraged them to agitate, to organise and to support each other. In America, uh, interestingly enough, he trained to be a lawyer. At one point, he was invited to San Francisco to work as a legal representative on behalf of black seamen. He also worked for a newspaper, The Elevator, which was a coloured newspaper, as it was called, while he was there. And then he sort of disappears off the radar. We think he died around 1879, but his later years are a total mystery. What we do know from census returns, though, is that most of his family, including William Jr., returned to England, and most of them resettled in Liverpool. But sadly, it seemed that Mercy and William had separated. So why should we remember this man who was humble, soft-spoken, devoted to his family and extremely hard-working? Well, he was devoted to his family, but he was also devoted to the cause of abolition. He was devoted to the cause of seamen getting fur rights. And he was devoted, I think, to humanity because from his writings, from his lectures, he was a man full of compassion and kindness. And in terms of his contribution to the abolition movement, it was immense. He really was part of the nexus between Dublin, Liverpool and Boston that were at the heart of American and transatlantic abolition. <laughs>